You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. My name is Gabriel Valentin, and I am the creator of Digital Lizards of Doom and the founder of the brand new publishing company, Dizzy Doom Media. Today, I wanted to give you all a little tour of DDM and show you all of the rad stuff we have coming out. First, let's start with level one, Dizzy Doom, the first book in the Digital Lizards of Doom series. In this book, we meet Pineapple Pete, an ancient pineapple demon who has trapped an entire universe of characters inside a video game simulation. Unaware, the characters play out their roles as heroes and villains, bringing the famed wizard Dizzy Doom face to face with an evil robot known as Commander Echo. In the next book, Level 2, the story opens up just weeks after the ending of Book 1, with Commander Echo healing from a pretty severe battle. We get to learn more about Echo's relationship with his sidekick Spider-Nose and the truth behind why Spider-Nose is so loyal to Commander Echo in the first place. Meanwhile, on a far off distant planet, our heroes find themselves in a compromising situation where Dizzy Doom must harness the power of the atomic pineapple so he can fight a giant mech gorilla in an epic kaiju showdown that will determine the fate of an entire planet of moth creatures. These two books are only the first in an eight book series which will each take place in a different level of this video game world that this ancient pineapple demon has created. Everything we do here at Dizzy Doom Media is made for fans, by fans, and includes all of the things we love, from video games, tabletop gaming, comics, movies, and of course, music. Right now, I am currently working on several different multimedia projects, including a 21-song soundtrack with animation and a full orchestra. I'm also working with voice actors and puppeteers for the future adventures that will expand the Digital Lizards of Doom universe. I absolutely love putting these worlds together and making a place where everyone is encouraged to push their creativity to its max. So thank you so much for your support on this project. I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Be well. We got Gabe Valentine here. Um, you just heard his voice, uh, Dizzy Doom Media, Digital Le- uh, Lizards of uh, Doom. Gabe, uh, super excited after that lead in to introduce you to the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast. <laughs> What's up, brother? How's it going? Glad to be here. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so I listened to that uh, uh, promo. And uh, in doing a podcast about uh, creators, you know, there's a sound universe there. There's this whole visual universe. It's colorful. There's so much creativity going on in this. And I thought it'd be a good way to start to hear about to hear about you and in, in, in putting together um, this this media. There's so much there. Tell us about tell us about what you're up to. Um. Well, thank first of all, thank you, man. Like, um, it's, you know, as an artist, I know I speak for a lot of artists, if not, um, most artists, maybe even all of artists, but, uh, it's, it's such a slog to, to get this stuff out there and to, and to dig deep in yourself and pull these things out and to, first of all, be, comfortable or maybe not even comfortable but be willing to put them out on page and so when people respond to it like you have and it just means the world to to myself and i, I know many other people as well so thank you so much man first of all yeah um because uh yeah it's it's gnarly uh, this stuff comes from real places and um yeah man i mean speaking on the art i just i just want to make cool stuff like that's uh i that's just something I really, really want to do. I want to make cool art that makes me proud that, that are, that are made from stories that I'm just not getting right now. I know D is the, is the manifestation of 
years of hanging out with my friends, uh, campfires and by the pool and by the beach and just talking about how come no one's made a story like this yet? How come no one's done this yet? Like, oh, I really wish it'd be so cool if Zack Schneider would make something like this or it'd be so cool if Kevin Smith would write something like this. It'd be so cool if blah, blah, blah. And so after years and years and years of that, um, I just finally said, I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to do it for myself uh, just because I'm, I was just really missing this story. You know, I, I love, I love Star Wars. I love high fantasy. I love space adventure. Uh, and I love Final Fantasy is one of my favorite video game series of all time. And I just wasn't really getting that from a lot of the graphic novels I was reading and looking for. I mean, we have Saga, which is amazing. Yes. Um, don't get me wrong, but it, it, it was, it's amazing in a different way. Yeah. I really wanted this. I wanted something that made me feel like a kid again. I wanted something that made me feel excited to wake up on, you know, Friday morning or, or get home by Friday afternoon so I could watch Batman Beyond or uh, Static Shock, um, whatever, Ninja Turtles, you know. So, so I really wanted something that made me feel like that again and I hadn't experienced. Or spending, spending the night at your friend's house on Friday nights, you know, after a long school, a long school week and then, just playing video games all day, Saturday and Sunday, man, I just like, I just missed that. So, so I was trying to make basically like a bite sized pill of that and giving that to the world um, and anyone who would listen or, or read. So through that came all these different art forms. We have the story came first, which uh, a lot of people still don't know about, but the story came first I was writing this story, Digital Lizards of Doom, and I didn't have the finances or anything in place to produce a graphic novel the way I wanted to. So I, I knew a lot about music and I, I had been in bands. So I started just writing songs about the characters and creating a world for them and kind of like an ecosystem for them to exist in with the hopes that when it came time to expose the world to the, the book, I would kind of already have this built-in fan base. So I did that for years. I ended up getting picked up by Noise Cartel Records. The music kind of t took on a life of its own, which was uh, just totally blew my mind. And we started touring regularly, um, playing with so many different musicians. Our first album had, I think, seven or eight different um, features on it from musicians all over the world. It was just totally wild. And then you know, I, that kept going on. And then I was like, wait, like this, this is awesome, but people still don't know the story and I'm in a better place financially and I have a little bit more connections now. So I buckled down and I finalized the first four books. It's, um, there's, we're on, we're on book two right now. Uh, that's about to come out and, but all eight books are written which is awesome. I'm really stoked yeah. about that. Yeah. And um, so I finalized the story. I had it finite. I made the maps. I made the technology. I made the ships and everything that I, I wanted to include. Made the, the Bible, I guess, basically, of the universe. And then we started getting to work. I got uh, hired artists and um, editors and, and everybody to <clears throat> help me make the first book. Um, I pitched the first book to Clover Press, which was, uh, there as they were, it's a, they're founded by Ted Adams and Robbie Robbins, the, the founders of IDW and, um, they picked it up and we sold a couple thousand copies in one month. And then, um, now we're doing the second book and it's just, and I'm, I'm not, I'm no longer with Clover Press. We're all, we're all friends and everything, but, um, I went out on my own and, started my own publishing company and I just needed a little bit more freedom to make the music, to make the, the animation that I want to do to make the, the spinoff series that I want to do. So, um, I just kind of took it back and we're, like I said, we're getting ready to release book two and it's just an accumulation of music, uh, visual art. Vi we're working on video games and apps. Um, 
animation. It's just a universe where everyone's welcome and people who enjoy all of these different things that make us nerds can come and have a safe place to, to enjoy and, and have fun. in. so, yeah. And, and you know, there's uh, thank you for all of that. It's, 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 it's really inspiring and exciting. And one of the things I mentioned to you was like all the different components that brings that, that universe to life. And um, thinking about like in, on this podcast, uh, obviously I, I talked to a lot of different type of creators, but this conversation is a bit unique in the sense of like the integration of these different forms into, in, into the universe. I heard a lot about what you're saying, Gabe, um, you know, as far as like, you know, being able to be, uh, be a kid, right. To, to enjoy yeah. yourself, you know, as, as an adult, we forget, we forget that. And we're um, not, not to, you know, it, 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 <laughs> we get, we get busy. One of the things I wanted to mention to you, um, because I was thinking about all the different components of what you do. I was talking to my son, who's a, who's a gamer. He loves fantasy, loves games. And of course, games are so advanced right now. I was yeah. telling him about when I, uh, when I, uh, I'm 48. So my first computer was a Texas instrument computer. My favorite game was awesome. Tunnels of Doom, which was a very simple dungeon crawler of 10 levels. And you loaded the game with uh, cassette data into the computer and wow. it was a total of 32K, uh, both the game and going into it. But it was a full, like, uh, universe. And I was talking to my kiddo, and I'm, I'm trying to explain this. I'm like, this is of such a different time and era. It's difficult to yeah. explain data loading in through a cassette tape. So, <laughs> um, obviously, so much more at, 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 at your disposal now. But I want to, Gabe, I want to go to the, the, the kind of, like, seminal question I ask at the at the beginning uh, of, of, you know, formal interview, when you were born, talking about you when you're a kid, when you were born, were you an artist when you were born? So, you know, I, I used to say no uh, to, to these types of, these types of questions, but like, or, or when people would ask like, Oh, when did you start? When did you know you wanted to be an artist? And, um, I don't really know when I, I knew, I think I knew when I was about, I want to say when I was about 13 or 14 is when I think I knew, knew, but, um, before then, um, and then again, I used to say no to this question, but I think from birth I was, um, I've always been a storyteller. So not an artist, like I wasn't really writing anything down or drawing. I can't draw for crap. Everyone needs to know that. I can't draw to save my life. But um, I, I can't either, Gabe. We, we shared that of drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. I mean, you should see. I wish I had something. You should see my storyboards because I do I do all the storyboards for, for the, for the um, book. Um, and... I am just constantly apologizing to my artists. Like, no, that's commander echoes head. That's not a, that's not another planet. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I like, like draw things like it's like inside, but there's stars. No, those aren't stars. Those are supposed to be torches. Like, Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I do all the storyboards for the graphic novel, but it's, it's like stick figures and bubbles. But, um, but no, I think at a very young age, um, we, I grew up, my family and I, um, weren't very, uh, financially well off. Um, and we weren't like poor, like starving or anything like that. You know, my dad had a, had a, he worked for the city of San Diego and, um, you know, it wasn't like we were scrounging for food or anything like that. So I don't, I don't want people to get that impression, but, um, but we didn't really have a lot of, we had enough to get by. That's, that's basically what we had. And we lived on the land a little bit. Like we had chickens and, um, uh, goats and we had our own vegetables and things like that. Um, and so growing up was very interesting because we didn't have a TV for a long time. And once we even got a TV, it was VHS tapes. They wouldn't even buy a DVD player. 
they they only they bought whatever the cheapest thing was because they didn't really watch TV. So they just bought a VHS player. So I actually got to grow up with VHS, yeah, which is pretty cool um, because I know a lot of people my age didn't. So um, so that was pretty cool. And then um, so I, like through that and kind of running out of content because we we have a very limited amount of what we could watch on TV. Unless again, unless I went to my friend's house um, or my cousin's house or grandma's house. When I went to grandma's house, it was just cable. She had cable, so it was just like we watched everything. Like I was just glued to the TV, but um, it was like it was almost like I was hibernating, you know, or getting ready for hibernation. Like no Google hibernation, just like like a like a squirrel, just cramming as much TV as I could. Um, but no, because of that, I never. Um, I just kind of told my own stories to myself, to my family. I just would like make things up. Um, you know, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I saw like a like a." Um, dragon today. He was like in the sky, and um, and I I I tried to follow him, but you know I kind of lost him around here. And I I'm pretty sure there's a there's a cave in my yard somewhere in our yard where where this dragon lives. I'm gonna find him, you know. And I would just like they were so outlandish that I I hope people thought <laughs> or people like knew I was being silly. But you know I I think there's probably some times where my parents worried about me. But um, but I would tell these stories, and I would tell stories for other people. I would try to make people laugh, and I would try to distract myself, too, with these stories and just try to create this universe that I wanted to live in instead of the current one that I was in. So, yeah. I again, I used to say I wasn't – or no, that I wasn't a creator when I was born, but um, now – I've, I've really changed the way I look at that because I think I've always just been a storyteller just naturally. Um, even when it came to getting out of trouble, the ridiculous stories that I would come up with to try to lie and get out of punishment was just, I mean, no one in their right mind would ever believe the things I said. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was fun. It was like fantastic and it was an escape. And since I didn't have, I always wonder if, if if I would have had access to these things, like if I would have been able to watch more TV or if I would have been able to play more video games or anything like that, if things would have changed. So I, I really don't know. My, my first console, like my first TV console, this is no joke, was uh, PlayStation 4. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I grew up because my parents were like, no video games. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff. So I grew up playing portable handhelds because they wouldn't let me have a TV in my room. And they wouldn't let – like a friend could spend the night and we could we could hook up a console to the, our TV that night. But when he went home, it went home with him. Yeah. So for me, I got – my uncle got me a Game Boy Pocket um, like late 90s, I think, and maybe early 2000s. And that just changed my life. And it was it was Game Boy. It was just Game Boy, yep. uh, PlayStation Portable, whatever portable system I could get my hands on. So most of my video game memories are from portable handhelds because I wasn't allowed to play, you know, console games. So so yeah, I, I always wonder if like these things influenced me in in such a strong way. I mean, I fell in love with Final Fantasy because you couldn't really play shooters on a Game Boy; they didn't work. Right. Um, I played Legend of Zelda, and you know the, that's the stuff I played. And it's just it's bizarre how much that stuff had an influence on me. So yeah, I I mean, you bring up uh, so many fascinating questions. Like you said, I mean, if you define yourself as uh, you know like a storyteller and seeing yourself having that attribute, sometimes like right now, there's so many stories that are being told to us, and we can adopt those mythologies and those type of stories, but. Maybe if we're not exposed to them or we want to create our own, you know, there's this whole other space over here where you're like, this is the universe I'm creating, not one that's yeah. really set for me. So I think how I could see that and how you develop digital lizards of doom is going to be very particular to your history, like in, in, yeah. in, in, in you know, in your life. Um one of the I you know I asked uh, some some big questions uh, in this show and um, the one I like a lot um, about art um, I like to apply it to to one of my 
passions, which is, you know, graphic novels, comic books. When you talk about the universe that's created, um, when I was a kid, that was the universe that I went into and I adored. And I got that from my dad, you know, who loved comics. Um, when we start talking about art uh, and I do it in the show, everybody kind of gets what you know which is art is this art is 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 that art or is this high art or low art or defining yourself as an artist i don't paint or all that type of thing yeah big question as i'm just mumbling along here is (laughs) what is art what is art you know i my brain my brain goes to this very simple just kind of quantifying explanation i I feel like i feel like art is anything that somebody creates that is inspired by an emotion an event a memory, a person inspired by anything, basically like, you know, I, even if I don't appreciate the art, like I remember one of the wackiest things I think I've ever seen was in New York. There was this, there was this, uh, museum of like high fashion art, or or I don't know if it's like, I don't think high fashion was the right word, but just this, you know, high quality next level art. And it was a bed. It was a bed frame with a mattress on it covered in baloney and like the whole thing was covered in baloney and um it may have been a statement like a animal rights statement i'm not sure um i got that vibe i i didn't spend too much time on it yeah but you know people were kind of like then i heard about it later in in the news and and people were like kind of dogging on it and you know, I'm kind of like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. Maybe if the artist explained it to me, I would. Um, but that's still art to me. Um, because that person, something happened to that artist that caused him to go out and make these things. He spent time on it. You know, he... He designed this thing. I don't know if you heard recently. There's a guy who sold a um, he sold an invisible statue, an yep. invisible sculpture. Did you hear about that? I did. And and my friend, my friend, you know, because we've actually had this conversation a couple of times. And he's like, "Okay, oh, hey, so even you, even you have to admit that this isn't art. This is this is something invisible that the guy created. Like you can't even like bullshit your way through this, right? Like." And I'm like, uh, and he's like, no, like what? Come on, man. Like there's no way this is considered art. And I said, dude, here's the thing though, that (laughs) people keep missing. I'm not even saying, I'm not even saying I like what that guy did. I'm not even, I'm not even saying like, I think it's a cool thing. But what I am saying is that he provided an experience for this individual whoever purchased that item that invisible item um he cre- he is now creating an experience for how many other people who are going to walk into that guy's home and ex- and say that and leave that guy's home saying uh we got to experience the invisible sculpture that's he just created a talking point he just created an experience yeah. that's art and I'm not even saying, I'm not even saying like that I think everyone should do that or like that I would have bought it if I had like, cause I wouldn't have, but that's not even something I would want to do, but you have to, you have to give credit where credit's due. And I, I think we're in a weird time right now where like people just, everything is so black and white. I think people have really forgotten how to communicate with each other and understand each other. Um, it's either like that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. This guy has an invisible sculpture. I thought it was dumb. 
I'll, I'll be honest. Like when I first saw it, I thought it was kind of silly. They're not dumb. I thought it was silly. Yeah. But the more I thought about it, and who knows? Like who knows the point behind him doing this? The more I thought about it, I was like, you know, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, he made something, and here I am. I'm affected by it because we're talking about it. So like I I got to experience on it, it, that that art form on a small level. Um, so I think art is just anything that causes you to create. Now, some might argue that because it's invisible, he didn't create anything, but he created an experience. So he still created something. Um, you know, the only reason books are, are selling is because you, you buy a book and the words are written down. But, you know, when we were in the caveman days, we just shared these stories with each other and drew pictures on the wall. So, you know, that's not real. That's not something tangible. You can't, you can't like, you know, besides the drawing, of course, you can't just tell a story to somebody, you know, jokes, jokes are free, but that's art. That's an art form. So, so yeah, I think, I think anything that just inspires you to create is, uh, and, and then the, the form of doing so creating the thing would, would be art. And I think, uh, I think I think it's cool. I think I think it's interesting that stuff like that exists. But um, I mean, I, I'm trying to do it a little bit in a different way. But make it um, make it make it a little bit easier than a, a no uh, in the invisible graphic novel. Yeah. You know, the invisible graphic <laughs> novel. I like you, Gabe, but I'm I'm definitely looking for the digital lizards of doom, <laughs> not because then the, I I. I uh, on the invisible sculpture, I, I I really share a lot of your thoughts because I think it I think what it does for me that's philosophy right there right because they were talking yeah. about a thought we're talking about a thing and I would say let's say you and I and eight other people were standing around the table and that artist said well here's the invisible sculpture and would you like to talk about it right and you're looking at yeah. it and you're being like oh that that one's holding and it's a sword. It's holding a mighty sword and look over at me. I'm saying, no, that's a beautiful goddess from, you know, like, and there's a conversation going on and it's, it's like the idea of the artist is trickster, which, you know, that's always fun. It's always fun. And um, so, yeah, we'll, um, we will, uh, maybe I'll plop in the invisible sculpture as a question in future episodes, Gabe, and you and I, Awesome. Through that, we'll explore uh, what an invisible sculpture is uh, for us. I'm fascinated. You're fascinated. We'll talk about it some more. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So um, I appreciate your comments around uh, what, art, what art is and definitely a lot of questions that come out of that. What about – or say now you have an art piece. Um, doesn't matter what it is. But I want to ask you, Gabe, what is the role – of art, like what is art supposed to be doing for us as humans? Do you think it has a proper role, or what's its role in society? Um, man, that is a really good question. Um, I don't. I feel like it's something similar to how I feel about God is, I I don't think. I don't think something like that should be put into a box. Um, and I, I think there's there's people out there who would probably definitely or disagree with me on that. But um, I don't know. I don't think I don't think it has a specific purpose. Um, I think it's it can be applied to so many different things. That's what makes it so beautiful. So I think that when it comes to, you know, it can be used, it can be used for evil. It can be used to tear people down. You know, it can, someone can make something that describes a group of people or, um, gets other people to hate a certain group of people. Um, it can be used to lift people up. It can be used as an escape. It can be used as satire, you know, very, which is a very popular form of art right now is satire and 
twisting twisting the fabric of reality just enough to where you laugh at it but it's still sad because it's something that exists or whatever so i don't know i don't know if there's like a proper use but i think that's why it's it's kind of the <clears throat> it's kind of a last frontier kind of thing because you know we we actually just kind of talked about it is like what even is art and i think it's something that hopefully stays wild that's never really tamed um i don't even know how that that could happen um but i don't know i mean for me personally what i use it for is to help calm my mind my mind is constantly racing with a lot of different things and struggling with a lot of different things and art really the art forms that I enjoy the most, I should say, because obviously not all art, but the art forms that I enjoy and I spend time on really help ease my mind and calm my spirit. Um, and I think of uh, the story of of uh, David and uh, David and Saul when, and from the Bible. And, and Saul's just, he has all these, he's like, crazy and he's like killing the these people and these these doctors and these these wizards and they he's like i need help like someone help me with it sounds like he has an anxiety you know and he can't nothing is soothing him and then here comes along this guy with a harp david and he just plays this beautiful music and it soothes it soothes 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 <laughs> um uh, saul's mind yeah and so, um, yeah, I just think, I think about that and I, I feel like that's what it, uh, that's what the purpose is for me is just to calm me down. It's soothing. It's, um, comedic. It takes me to a different world. It makes me, it inspires me. It makes me feel like I can go out and be powerful and do these things and accomplish wonders. Um, and then uh, for other people, you know, it's, it could be a reminder of of how crappy things are. You know, it could be a negative thing. It could be, or again, it could lift people up too. It could remind, it could remind us that we can do better. Um, so I don't know. That's that's a really. I'm gonna have to think about that some more because that's a really. That's a really awesome question. I've never yeah. really thought about what the purpose of art is. Yeah, and and I um, one of the things that I found, and and thank you uh, for your for your comments, Gabe. One of the things I found in the podcast, you know, um, so there's over a hundred episodes right now, and of course, prior to doing it, you don't know what it is. You don't know what mm -hmm. conversations you can have, and you don't know what journey you're going to go on. But one of the things that quickly developed and I've talked about this before, is that really just got into psychology, healing, uh, personal expression, like an authentic life in it. It wasn't just like, what, what's the art thing that you made? And what about that? It was like, yeah, that came out as a decisive moment in my life when I left this, created this, and I created a whole new persona. Like after that, it's like, whoa, okay. Like, it isn't just <laughs> it isn't just a painting I put up on the wall. It is a representation of a transformation, and um, yeah. and it, it, not wanting to describe that, but just recognizing and honoring the power of that uh, is something that I quickly learned um, to do, and it really connected the personal, you know, the personal to the to the uh, what what you create. Um, That's awesome, man. So, Gabe, uh, I know I've been hitting you with the big questions. Um, oh, this, no way, man. I, I love this. this awesome. <laughs> I know. I know you do. Um, and we're speaking with Gabe Valentine, uh, creator of uh, Digital Lizards of Doom, uh, Dizzy Doom Media. And um, the question I have, uh, you can refer to objects or people, what or who made you who you are? <clears throat> Actually, I kind of know the answer to this question. Uh, there's a lot of people around me, 
and I could I could list the people all day long. Um, but there's so many. I got I was so fortunate to have good people in my life that um, helped guide me down certain paths and and steered me away from other ones. And there's just way too many to to name, but quantifyingly, um, I would probably say Samurai Jack, um, <laughs> Samurai Jack, Superman, Batman, um, Indiana Jones. These were like my role models growing up. Um, Jesus, actually, uh, you know, there's not the, not the surfer dude, white Jesus that, you know, we've, or like a bad religion puts it the best, the American Jesus. I freaking love that song. Right. One of my favorite bands of all time is bad religion. Yeah. Um, but, uh, not that the, the biblical personification of Jesus, the, the man who opened his heart up to poor, rich, um, prostitutes, um, uh, liars, murderers, thieves, um, and just showed, um, religious nut jobs too, even, you know, even, even talk to them, even talk to the religious people and, and tried to get them to change their ways. Like you guys got it all wrong, man. Like, no, 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 no. You know, though God isn't, God isn't expensive. You know, you don't have to pay for God. You know? <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't like you or love you less if you give him money. You know, it's not, it's not how it works. And um, so, you know, growing up with these and reading these stories, Greek mythology, I love Greek mythology. Um, I Hercules uh, was, I got into Hercules because of Superman. You know, I, I had, heard all of these, I had read all these Superman comics and I was like, what a cool story. And so I was like, well, you know, Superman was based off like Hercules. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm not, I'm not so sure if that's totally entirely true now, but I went back and that's how I first heard about Hercules and I read the Hercules stories and there's definitely a lot of similarities there. Um, and so, yeah, man, I just, these heroes that, they did not always have it easy, but they, they made the right decisions and they struggled and they fell and they rose again and they continued to fight and fight for people, fight for good. And these are the things that made me who I am. I want to fight for good. I want to fight for people. I want to love on people like if the people that the person that nobody else wants, because I've been there, I've been there so many times. I've been the person that nobody else wants yep. and, um, it, it hurts. It's a very hard feeling. It's a very dark and empty feeling. And if I'm around somebody, if I know them or not, I don't want that person to feel that way. If I'm there yep. and I'm within arm's reach, I just want to love on that person. I want them to know that, you know, they, they have someone they can count on and they can, they can um, they can share uh, that experience with and someone that is happy that they exist, someone that believes in them and, and is happy that they are alive and and alive on this earth and present on this earth. And um, a lot of these themes too are, are in are sprinkled throughout um, the Digital Lizards of Doom series. Um, I touch on a lot of different mental health issues. Um, not so much, I don't try to keep it heavy handed cause I still want it to be light and fun and, and silly. But I, I feel like for the people who have gone through the things that get mentioned in the book, I feel like they'll know when they, when they read it. But, um, but, uh, yeah, man, I, I think it's, uh, these are the things that made me who I am and I, I hope other people, I hope other people just want to start loving on each other, man. It's it's time. It's, um, it's really time, man. Like, aren't you guys tired of it? You know, like, I just try to tell people that, like, 
Aren't you tired of just hating this side because they voted for this guy or that side because they voted for that guy? And 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 all of this stuff just trips me out. How you know, I've said this a couple times before. If you really think about it, we all want the same thing. Like everybody, everybody in in the world, for the most part, wants the same thing. We want the government to stay out of our business. We don't want the government or somebody else to tell us what we can and can't do with our bodies. Um, we don't want anyone telling us who we can and can't marry. We don't want we want to we want to have a nice house. We don't want to be starving. Or not even a nice house. We want to be able to eat, you know, eat yeah. food and provide for our families and and our friends and have friends over and enjoy and laugh yeah. and sing songs together, whatever you want to do, watch TV together. Um, and we want to feel safe. We don't want to feel like if we go outside, we're going to get shot or we don't want to feel like, yeah. you know, um, we we can't go enjoy nice things because we're not rich enough or whatever it is. How is it that pretty much if you asked, if you, if you, for the rest of your life, ask that question around the world, I guarantee you like 99.9% .9 of the people are going to say that that's how they feel. Right. And yet we are, we are so divided right now. This person's mad at that person. That person's mad at this person. And it's just, it's amazing the confusion that, I mean, the powers that be, because I don't know who they are. I don't, I don't know who's pulling the strings or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, it blow, it trips me out, man. It trips me out that like we all pretty much want the same thing and yet we're so divided. And so that's, those are the types of questions and stuff I try to put in my books and in my art is like, how, how can we remove these lies and stuff from what we've been told our whole lives and get back to the basics of humanity and being there for each other and um, being united. So went off on a little bit of a rant there. But no, man, I would, and I'm just, <laughs> you know, honestly, uh, you know, listening and, and, and engaging with that. I mean, I think of a lot of what you had to say there of like the potential for art to bring empathy, right? Like to of yeah. art to like connect people. I heard a, a lot about the, that there. And, you know, honestly, too, about even, you know, saying the word, uh, saying the word love, I deal with, the, you know, I, I work as a union rep in my, my, my day job, and I've been involved in collective endeavors for a long time. And those collective endeavors are based on love, right? Uh, the working person is somebody that I love and respect. And I want them to have a good working experience. And yeah. when you mentioned the word in that concept, it, it in that context, a lot of times, particularly as a male, it's like, all right, fruity. All right. enough. <laughs> the, you know what I mean? But oh, yeah. for me, it's the fundamental basis of, of, of doing things. Cause if I didn't love and I didn't give a shit, I, I don't, it's something else that I'm doing and it's not yeah. what I'm doing. And it's connected to art as well, because I think a lot like with you creating a universe, Gabe, and you inviting folks into it and the color and the music or the permission to, to be a, a child that isn't, you know, I think it's pointed towards, you know, compassion and love and just invitation, you know, permission to be a child. Wow. You just dude. That is an epic sentence right there. Oh, yeah. you can take that <laughs> 10 seconds. It's yours. You can. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Permission to be a child. That's that's amazing, man. Wow. I've um, through recent uh, conversations I've had with people who are experts in childhood development, who are artists, who are teachers. Um, they see they see everything that kids have, that adults still have, that adults still remember. And um there, there, you know, there's, there's a, there's a whole lot there. I really appreciated uh, your comments. And, um, uh, you know, I think one of the things, the way you spoke about is something that I like of speaking about things and maybe in an idiosyncratic way of, right. Of like taking Jesus Christ and not saying, okay, here's a pre-described pre-digested version you're going to say, yeah. no, this is, this is, this is a personal thing. This is what it means to me. This is what yeah. I got. And, um, that's really powerful. Um, and, and I, I really appreciate that. Gabe, we're on a roll right now. So I'm going to go for the titular, let's, question, let's get it. the titular question of the, of the entire show. And it could be a short answer. It could be a long answer, but 
I don't know the answer to the question of why is there something rather than nothing? Wow. Why is there something rather than nothing? The first thing that comes to my head is because the reason that there's something rather than nothing is so I could be sitting here right now having this experience in this conversation with you. And I would apply that to, I would try to, because I, I, I will definitely fail, but I would try to apply that to and encourage others to apply this to every aspect of life. The reason there is something rather than nothing is because you are experiencing something right there in that moment. And that's, that's reason enough. Yeah. And if you look closely, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to find a reason for, for that lesson you're being taught for that love that you're receiving, you know, for that, for that pain, you know, if you're experiencing pain, uh, and you're going through a hard time, you've been going through a hard time and I'm preaching to the choir here. Everybody's <laughs> listening, preaching to the choir kids. Um, <laughs> It's hard. It's really hard. It's it's extremely difficult to to understand why we're we're going through painful situations. Uh, but what I have realized, I've met a lot of people all over the world, from all different parts of the world. Been to a few different parts of the world myself, and you might be going through something. And based on how you come out of it, something painful, based on how you come out of it, you might be able to bless somebody else with knowledge on how to get through it. They might not have the same tools or resources you did, but because you went through the same thing and you're the person that you are, you might be able to save somebody's life. You know, you might be a more resilient person that this thing might not it still hurts, but it, it's not the end all for you, but it might be the end all for somebody else. Yeah. And if you come in contact with that person and you say, Hey, this is how I got through it. Have you ever heard of this book really helped me? Yep. This teacher really, these words really meant a lot to me. And that per, you might save a life in something like that. So, and it's not always that, you know, dramatic, but, um, but I would say, yeah, that's, that's the answer. That's, it's because you something exists rather than nothing because you needed to be here in this moment experiencing this thing. So. Yeah. Uh, woo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, uh, Gabe, um, I want you to spend a little bit uh, time now uh, on, on unwinding and unpacking how the audience, how listeners can connect with your art, Dizzy Doom Media, <laughs> Digital Lizards of Doom. Uh, I want folks to know and have in their hands or in their ears how to interact with okay. your art. Um, yeah, so I, I think, so I've been saying this a lot lately. Um, I, I've been telling people just to Google digital lizards of doom i've it's i don't know what it is but i think it's a little bit more entertaining uh people kind of get to click on what they want to click yeah. on so if you just google digital lizards of doom you know our, our uh our main website will come up at the top but and there's other things too there's articles about us there's there's articles about the world there's links to music um but if you want to get in touch with me directly and and quickly, um, I would say either email me at gabe at dlodworld dot com, or uh, message me on Instagram. Um, I'm on Instagram the most out of all of the social media platforms, so uh, it would just be Dizzy Doom Media, and um, I'll be on there. And you know, send me a message. Say hey, I want to, I want to talk or. I, I'm going through a rough time or, uh, I 
I want to hear some music. It doesn't have to be something serious either. It's like, I want to know more about what the story is about. And um, let me know. I'll send you like a digital copy or something. You can check it out. And if you want to, if you want to purchase it later, um, I would be honored. That'd be really cool. But yeah. And then uh, if you're on Twitter, um, it's just at DLOD world. And uh, Facebook is just digital lizards of doom. And, and then our website is dlodworld.com. So that's pretty much it. Thanks. Hey, um, normally don't ask a question after that game, but I do have a question because, yeah, yeah. Of the, because of the way that you describe the universe. And if I don't ask it, it, it probably ain't going to be asked. So I'm interested in the fact that you described of creating the digital lizards of zoom of doom with, with, with music. So it, it had this life and started to create characters of its own and sounds of its own that way. When you started to depict or start depict in, in, in visual form, all of that was, did it look different be, from like how things had kind of developed as far as sounds or the characters or voices? Did you end up with, there's a universe here that's been created with the sound and now it looks this way is that was there a collision <laughs> there um there's there's definitely a couple changes um uh, but for the most part it hasn't changed much which is which is kind of freaky um i've had the concept i've had the at at, at the soul of it i've had the concept for digital legends of doom since i think i was in high school oh. um just the idea and again in the in its simplest form not really character names yet but i've always been fascinated with this idea that if there was uh well for one i love trickster mythology like from from greek mythology i love tricksters how they can just manipulate time space reality and it and the the effects it can have on the universe and then um and the opposite. Sometimes it doesn't have any effect. So I've always been obsessed with the idea that this trickster, this, in this case, this ancient pineapple demon, um, could basically capture an entire universe and, uh, put it inside a video game and, and sell it to other universes. Like I've just always kind of had this idea in my head and it used to be planets. I actually wrote a song when I was 18 years old called pirating planets. And it's the first ever manifestation of this thought that I put out into the world. And it was with an old punk rock band I, I played in and I don't know. I've just always been fascinated with that idea. And so at the core of it, not a lot of stuff in D-Lot has changed. The The heroes and their motives haven't changed. Um, they, if it, What's changed has been the vehicles that get them there a little bit and the things that they might say. But for the most part, who they are hasn't changed. And mainly, um, I've been a little bit more open about this lately, but mainly it's because the main characters – in the book um, are basically what I go through on a day-to-day -day basis in my head. It's like my different, it's all of the different people and, uh, and emotions that I want to be and that I struggle with. You know, Pineapple Pete represents um, this controlling personality. You know, I, I, I feel I feel lost and I feel out of control sometimes, and I want to control everything in my yeah. world. And um, even though it might hurt other people, I want control. Uh, I seek control, and I have to fight that. And um, Dizzy Doom, who just always wants to do the right thing, he's he's the Superman, the Samurai Jack. You know, he's he always wants to do the right thing. He wants to be the hero. That's what I want to be. Um, but Dana Deathly, she represents. Um, pain and she she's a she wants to be a hero but she she's not sure if she's willing or has what it takes to be a hero because she's been screwed over so many times she's been hurt by so many people um and warty morta uh, she's the witch and she she represents 
um, pain. She represents all, she represents the, she's the opposite of Dana Deathly. Dana Deathly is the one who's been through the shit, yeah. but is deciding to do the right thing anyways. Wardy Morta is the one who's been through the shit, but she's, she's letting it change her yeah. into more evil. And it's this constant struggle I, I have myself. It's like, you know, someone hurts you, someone lies to you, someone, someone uh, lies to your face, screws you over. You want to like, you know, you want to get back at them. You want to like screw them over and, and you got to fight that because that's just, that's just going to lead you down a dark path, you know? And um, so, yeah, it's like these revenge fantasies almost. So because of that, the characters haven't changed that much because they're very real. They're very real conversations I have with myself and, uh, and this book is, in a way is basically therapy <laughs> yeah. uh, for myself and hopefully other people as well. Oh, Oh, oh uh, definitely. And that's the, that's, that's the, that's the component that, that holds so much power, you know, as we tell stories and see things and, or music, whatever way it reaches us, um, kind of do why you're doing what you're doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, Everybody, um, uh, we've been talking to uh, Gabe Valentine, and um, I really appreciate your time, Gabe. Um, I appreciate being introduced uh, to um, uh, to your work uh, and in in art. Uh, my, you'll recognize the position I'm in right now of wanting to grab at everything and everything that's in that universe. So I just got to be patient, take some time, grab this. That's the way that I am. I like to go all in on it. And and thank you for you know, kind of helping me and the, and the listeners kind of take a little, uh, you know, take a peek in about how the, how art's created and, and, and why you're yeah. doing it. Um, super pleased, Gabe, um, uh, for you to, for you to appear on, uh, on the podcast. Oh man, it's been an honor, dude. We got to do, we got to do this more often, man. We, we got so much stuff to talk about, so we'll have to we'll have to have like a part two or something like that. I would very much, uh, very much like to. And uh, heck, there's so many levels of D Lot or Digital Lizards of Doom. There's so many levels, and you just keep going. Each, <laughs> each, we'll keep doing each game level and see where we get, brother. Okay. Sounds good, man. Thanks so much, Gabe. We'll talk soon. We'll talk soon, man. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. This is something rather than nothing. 